So yeah, my name's Derek Yu. I'm best known as the, uh, the founder of a project called Moonbeam. And I wanted to talk to you today about uh, cross-chain DAP architectures. Um, I listened with some interest to Sergey's keynote uh, yesterday, and you know, one of the themes in that talk was around CCIP and around connecting different blockchains together to expand you know, what's possible, to expand, uh, create more new markets. And uh, I really liked that, and you know, I, I think this talk will kind of drill into that, um, uh, that topic a bit and uh, talk about a few different themes. So, uh, first a little context for those of you that don't know what Moonbeam is. So Moonbeam is a layer one uh, smart contract platform, uh, EVM compatible. It's deployed as a parachain on the Polkadot network. And really the, the, the key thing that we're focused on is interoperability use cases. So we've been working on cross-chain and interoperability use cases for, for some time now. Um, that is basically use cases on Moonbeam using uh, different kinds of general message passing providers, uh, of which CCIP is now, um, is now obviously a new one. But also, it's part of Polkadot, and Polkadot itself is an interoperability network, right? So a network of chains that are designed uh, to work with each other using a built-in messaging system called XCM. And so really it is through our work on Moonbeam and working with different uh, development teams building cross-chain use cases on Moonbeam, that's where a lot of the examples uh, that I'm going to use in this talk come from. And um, while they're Moonbeam-specific examples, really what I want to do is try to think a little bit about the themes that we're seeing, different kinds of um, uh, uh, themes that will be equally applicable uh, in other environments uh, as well on other chains. And so I'll start by just framing things up a bit in terms of kind of the mental model I use when I'm thinking about uh, these, uh, these different um, topics. So one, one mental model I have is around uh, compute. And so I'm, I'm kind of into the history of technology. Um, I've also been around a while. And so I was around in the development of compute, you know, uh, for the last, you know, 25, 30 years. And I see a lot of parallels, right? There's this old saying that uh, history doesn't repeat, but it kind of rhymes. And so this is one of the ways I think about how Web3 and blockchain interoperability will evolve is by looking to the past on what happened uh, with compute over time. And so, you know, I think about early days when there was you know, very few computers, you know, they had a lot of features to be able to share the resources, right? So uh, I'm old enough where in university, you know, we were sharing a Unix server, basically. That feels kind of like an Ethereum-like idea, right? You're kind of sharing the resources of one computer. You know, then you move to a world where you can have your own computer. So that's either a PC or a dedicated server if you're hosting you know, an application. That's kind of where we are now, right? There's kind of this ability for anyone to have their own blockchain. And it's getting e ever easier to create your own blockchains. But really, the, the key inflection point on the compute side was when networking came around, right? When you could network these different computers together, that was the big unlock. And you know, my own idea here is that a similar unlock will happen as uh, blockchains become interoperable with each other. So similar to what happened with, uh, with compute. And so I'm always thinking about these historical analogies as I'm trying to figure out you know, what the next step is. So why don't we start just by reminding ourselves why cross-chain at all? So I'm a developer. Why is it that I would want to build something cross-chain? And you know, again, just referring back to the keynote from yesterday, you know, I really think the first of these points is the most important. It's about market size. So the TAM of your application, your protocol that you're building, you know, if you just focus it to one blockchain, you know, that TAM is, is limited, right? And I think for anyone that's trying to build a protocol or an application that's servicing a lot of users, you need to reach those users. You need to reach the users in demand uh, where they exist. So I think Sergey made this point nicely in the context of uh, these banks that have created their own chains. They're expecting users to come, and they said, oh, well, actually, we need to go find like, the users and create markets you know, for these different assets that are being issued or services that are being provided. So to me, this increased market is, is really the key, the key driver. But there are also other drivers. So for example, uh, increased efficiency, right? The ability to leverage different uh, specialty functions from different chains to create a more efficient setup than having, for example, separate deployments that are isolated on each, on each chain you're trying to target. And then and this uh, concept of UX as well, you know, we'll go through some examples where um, the, uh, 
the cross-chain technique allows you to create a better UX. And I think this is also going to be another key driver for adoption using cross-chain. So just very quickly on tech stacks out there, you know, when we started the Project Moonbeam, there was really Polkadot and Cosmos for the two interoperable chain ecosystems. Obviously, that landscape has changed quite a bit. There's a lot of activity on the L2s these days. Most all the, all the major L2 ecosystems have this vision of creating an interoperable set of rollups now. So I continue to see that the landscape will be this kind of fragmented landscape with different enclaves of interoperable chains, um, which then these enclaves need to talk to each other. So that's kind of what I see the next two to three years looking like, these different ecosystems evolving. And so I want to go through a few examples now and pull out some themes that uh, you know, I think are relevant by looking at these examples around, uh, around cross-chain. So one category of use case that you know, is kind of the low-hanging fruit that you see right off the bat is around what I call like asset and automation. So asset and automation, like in, in this case, one-click assets. I'll give a couple examples from Moonbeam to help illustrate it, but this is happening you know, in a lot of different environments. So the idea is, so let's take the example of Osmosis. For those of you that don't know, Osmosis is a, uh, uh, a chain in the Cosmos ecosystem, implements a decentralized exchange. And uh, one of the features they have is there is an ability to, for end users to deposit DOT into Osmosis with one click. So as a user, you're presented with a dialog to enter your, your uh, Polkadot address, and you can deposit DOT. What's happening behind the scenes when that happens? There's actually quite a few numbers of steps that are happening. So the DOT starts on the Polkadot relay chain. It's actually moved to Moonbeam via XCM, the native, the native interop protocol within Polkadot. It then uses a GMP to transit to like Osmosis. And then there's like an, an LP or deposit action that happens um, on, the, on the Osmosis side. So you have these four or five steps that are happening in the background. But the user, you know, they don't see any of that, right? They just see this deposit, and then it happens. So I think this is an example of where cross-chain is being used to kind of hide complexity away from the user and automate a number of steps, including asset movements, but create a better user experience. And so this is happening you know, in a lot of different ways across a lot of different environments. And this is an example of that. I see this as probably one of the, the first things that get adopted when it comes to cross-chain. Uh, though the same scenario happens in reverse with something called Moonbeam Routed Liquidity. That's just in the reverse direction, where you might be on mainnet, you have ETH, you can one-click deposit it to one of the other chains on Polkadot. Behind the scenes, it transits via GMP to Moonbeam. It then gets, re gets rerouted onwards via XCM to its final destination. And so I think in this example, you, know, you see the combination of two different GMP providers, two different kind of uh, cross-chain interoperability protocols that are being tied together to create like a, an overarching kind of scenario or effect. That's also something that I think we'll see more of, especially as these enclaves of interconnected chains continue to evolve. So this assets and automation, this is one example that has these themes built into it. But let's look at another example. So um, I'm taking an example here from the Moonbeam ecosystem um, of a DeFi protocol called Prime. It's called Prime Protocol. It implements one of the architectural patterns that we've seen a number of teams adopt, so uh, something called a hub-and-spoke architecture. So a hub-and-spoke architecture, what that means is there is a hub contract on Moonbeam, and then you have a number of other contracts on other chains, but they're tied together via general message passing system, like a CCIP. And the idea is that a user can take an action on Avalanche, so let's say, deposit something there. Uh, a message is sent back to the hub recording that, that action. And uh, then they can go to mainnet, for example, and say, OK, now I want to borrow against that. It queries back to the hub and says, ah, this user has this set of assets deposited on, across other chains, so let me let them borrow. So it's kind of a protocol that spans multiple chains simultaneously. Um, but like, it's also kind of blockchain agnostic in a way, right? The user can interact with it from any chain. And so I see this as an example of efficiency, right? This is strictly better than having separate lending markets on each chain. You have a single market that's spanning multiple chains. And so I see that as both like a UX win and an efficiency win. And this pattern is something that we're seeing multiple teams adopt because they'll be able to compete against these folks that are taking this unnetworked approach. And one other interesting point here is that what, what, you know, what role does Moonbeam play? The users don't even realize they're interacting with Moonbeam in this case. 
Moonbeam is in this back-end role where it's kind of coordinating things, almost like a back-end cloud. And so as GMP messages are being sent back to Moonbeam, it's occupying block space on Moonbeam, but um, you know, it's not something the user is directly interacting with. Just to take one more example in the gaming space, so here for gaming, uh, there's a game called Exile Racers. I think it's like spaceships, um, pilots. You'd have different NFTs you can, you can um, purchase and race. And so their concept is that they have racetracks on different chains. So you have a racetrack on Moonbeam, you have one uh, on Ethereum, and so on. You can move your ships to different chains. Where things get interesting is that the race results. So the results get aggregated back via GMP protocols back to Moonbeam. And then there's an integration with another chain called Zeitgeist that offers a prediction market. So there you can take out wagers on who wins like a certain race or who, who's going to win. And there'll be payouts based on the results. So you know, again, it's not just DeFi. It's like other use cases, other domains. People are figuring out how to use cross-chain to extend out and reach users um, where they are and where the demand is. So let's just talk for a minute about, about um, some other trends we're seeing. For folks that are adopting these different cross-chain messaging protocols as a core part of their architecture, there are some patterns that we're seeing um, in how they're thinking about things. And so I think one, one problem is, for a lot of these protocols, the question is, OK, this cross-chain messaging capability is now a critical part of my app. If it's not working for some reason, you know, then I'm dead in the water. Take the example of Prime that I just gave, where you know, they're a lending and borrowing protocol. So if the messaging system is not functioning, you know, then the end user funds are at risk. You know, they basically, uh, users could get liquidated, they'll be unable to interact with the protocol. And so one of the things that we've seen is that a, a lot of teams that have cross-chain as a critical part of their architecture are looking for redundancy options. Right? So instead of going just with one GMP provider, how can I hedge my bets? How can I kind of create a high availability or redundant system? Can I use two, three, uh, more than one? Uh, that starts to get a little bit complicated, though, then. Right? So if you're going to use two or three different messaging providers, then questions come up around, OK, how do I, how do I set this up in a high availability way? How do I make sure that you know, things don't happen more than once? Um, if something gets stuck on one, how do I retry it automatically? So there's a whole set of scenarios around kind of maturing and kind of making it for a high availability setup that we're seeing multiple teams hit and, and try to engineer themselves. And so one of the um, uh, areas that we've been doing some work is around this concept of having a router or firewall for cross-chain messaging. And so the idea is, again, back to this historical analogies, is something like, you know, if the GMP providers or the cross-chain messaging providers are like the, the networking providers, right? They're like the AT&T, Verizon, Telefonica. They're the people providing the transport. The question is, you know, how do you provide logic across multiple of those? So it's kind of analogous to, in the networking world, of something like uh, a Cisco, right? Some, someone who makes a router where the GMPs plug into this other protocol, which would then you'd be able to express different kinds of routing logic. Um, and so this is something that, like, you know, we're, again, we're seeing multiple teams kind of recreate the wheel. We're seeing them engineer some of this functionality into their own contracts. You see that once, twice, three, four, five times, and you realize, OK, there's probably something, uh, a protocol needed here so that everyone's not recreating the same wheel over and over again. And uh, so this is some, an area I'm quite interested in. You know, one scenario for ultra-high reliability you might do is, say, M of N. So let's say that you have three GMP providers. You say, you know what? If I, I send out all three and make sure that at least two of the three agree on the other side. So that way, if someone were to try to compromise the system, they actually have to compromise two independent uh, GMPs or bridges to be able to compromise the architecture. So I think that's, this is something that we're going to see much more of uh, moving forward. And on the firewalling side, it's the same idea, but for protecting contracts. right? So when you have messages sent to your contract, now it's kind of like when PCs were first networked you have a whole new class of threats you have to deal with, right? People might try to send a message to trick your contract into doing something. So how are you protecting it then, right? Like, are there certain known good sources and deny everything else? Um, these are the kinds of things that we're 
helping developers with on Moonbeam. So <clears throat> kind of trying to tie a bunch of these pieces together a bit, I'll contrast this, right? So I think th the discussion I see a lot of developers having is, OK, there's these different deployment options now. Do I deploy on a smart contract platform like, you know, like a Arbitrum or Optimism or just choose whichever one? Do I have my own app chain or app-specific rollup? And I think, for me, the future is, is kind of not binary like that. That's like a false dichotomy. You're going to have a smart contract in the shared environments because you can do unique things there, right? You can uh, synchronously interface with other protocols that are in, for example, the EVM alongside you. But you may also want your own block space, right? Your own roll-up, let's say, that can provide horsepower for the workloads that you have. And so I don't see it as a binary one or the other, but they'll be together, right? You'll have contracts that are networked together, along with perhaps chains that provide back-end capacity. In fact, specialized chains, I think that when you think about back-end services, having different kinds of specialized chains makes sense. For example, for storage. Right? Storage is not something you can do in an EBM. And then you know, on, the, on the kind of front-end side, it's extending out to meet the users you know, where they are. Um, again, back to some of the points that were from the keynote yesterday, it's like you, know, you can't just sit tight. You want to extend out and meet users where they are, especially where the demand is to create markets for whatever that service is. And so the, you know, the architecture starts to look kind of like, like, a, like an internet application architecture, right? You have different components, potentially different chains that are being combined together to create an overall effect. And so I, I definitely am interested in this and see this as kind of the way that um, things are going to move with more specialized chains connected together and meeting users like where they are. You know, the architectures are, that are used to build applications are going to get increasingly you know, complex, but also scalable, and potentially with like, better user experiences. And so this is something that's of quite a bit of interest to me. And you know, if I think about going, tying it back to the beginning of the talk around this analogy with uh, compute, you know, if compute evolved from these standalone computers to these highly specialized infrastructures, right? think about AWS, and you have a number of specialized services, each one of those services is backed by many, many different servers. But the developers kind of mixing and matching and picking the services they need to build their app. It's very, very scalable, very easy to use. That's the direction you know, I see Web3 going in, right? Where Web3, you, know, you had a single EVM deployment, contracts into an EVM. And that'll move to this environment where there's multiple specialized chains that are being tied together and acting as one system versus you know, n number of systems um, that are each independent and not talking to each other. And um, frankly, I think Chainlink is very well positioned for providing infrastructure for that kind of future you know, in providing you know, Oracle support, the new functions um, features are released, and of course, uh, uh, not least of which um, is uh, CCIP, which I fully expect to become a dominant player in the cross-chain messaging space. So, um, yeah, thanks very much. You know, if you're interested in learning more about Moonbeam and the things we're doing, feel free to visit us online.